Please welcome Florencia Hera Vega. So you are in this talk, which is dipping your toes into web security. Um, and this is part one of um, a series of things that I've been working on, so I'm calling it part one. Um, and we're going to talk mostly about HTTPS. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about how the internet works. To give you a little bit of backstory, uh, I am uh, from Costa Rica. I grew up in Germany, and I now have been living in Montreal for a while, which I think is why my little emoji thing has a beret. I'm not really sure. But, um, <laughs> Uh, and I am currently the CTO at Perio. We are a startup based in Montreal doing encrypted messaging and file sharing uh, for teams and enterprise mostly. Um, and I, I came into the security field in a kind of roundabout way um, as a, uh, actually a backend developer. So mostly I started out taking care of all the sort of backend database stuff um, and have been you know, diving deeper into the field of security uh, at, during this job. Um, and another thing about my background is that I am really into peer education and popular education. And I think that's a really important thing, both in terms of, of technology and quality of technology, and also in terms of just like social progress. Um, I think that making feel uh, kind of obscure or obscure seeming fields of study uh, accessible is a really important thing. So uh, I organized a bunch of uh, RailsBridge events in Montreal. And before that, I did a lot of uh, peer education stuff, mostly around sexual health. Um, and one thing that I've realized as I've gone uh, deeper into security is that there's this sort of fundamental, like it, it's, security is kind of like this black hole that no one wants to think about, especially on the web. And that includes people who are making stuff for the web. And that's really unfortunate because um, as people who make things, we make things that have consequences for people, whether that's uh, because you're putting your personal data there or because you, have, you expect some sort of reliability from something that you use, some software system that you use uh, to keep, your, to keep your, a particular part of your life going. Um, and so I love software. I love the web. I love web development. I love that it's uh, incredibly empowering. Um, and I love giving people the tools to make something and put it live on the internet. Um, and, and, and watching their faces light up, being like, oh my god, I made a thing. Um, and I think that's super awesome, but I also sometimes get really concerned that when folks go out and make things without understanding a lot of the consequences of the systems they make, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, and I think that, uh, for the most part, when we're talking about security, um, where does this? All right, all right, I'll get to that. Um, yeah, for the most part, uh, with security, it's not a thing that people learn, um, whether, it's, whether you're learning uh, how to develop on your own, whether you're going to some sort of uh, hacker boot camp, or whether, even where you're, whether you're learning it in a, in a formal computer science setting. Uh, I know, for one, that my computer science background did not prepare me at all for anything related to security, because uh, even anything about the internet that I learned was kind of taught in a very a theoretical and abstract way that I didn't really tie into the stuff that I later ended up doing professionally. It was kind of a strange space to be in. Um, and so, uh, so this talk uh, is kind of aimed mostly at um, beginner and intermediate developers, but it is also really, I think, for anyone who works with the web um, making things. So for example, product managers, project managers, designers, etc. Um, I think that uh, hopefully this talk will be helpful for you. Um, and if you are a senior developer and you know all this stuff, um, then uh, hopefully it'll still be fun. And also you can come talk to me afterwards if you found that something I said wasn't quite right, wasn't quite accurate, I could explain it better. I would love to have these conversations because I think it's really important um, to try to get this stuff right and to try to get it out there in an accessible way. Um, so just to, to, to sort of lead in, um, why is the internet so insecure? Um, like, really the main reason is that it was never really designed to be so huge and like ubiquitous. Um, so it, it was just like a bunch of people kind of tinkering and being like, ooh, we can send data this way. Um, and it didn't occur to them that that data would ever be particularly important or um, need to be kept confidential for some reason or another, um, or that you could wreak genuine havoc on society if you messed with that data. Um, so security is not built in. Um, and the internet is also gigantic and it is hugely unmaintained. So there's, 
you know, there's, there's parts of the internet that haven't been touched in decades and they're still, you know, serving requests in the exact same ways that they were, you know, more than 10 years ago. Um, and so that, that means that all of the evil things that people have devised since then um, can be used against these uh, web properties. So the second question is, why is learning about security hard? And I have a theory about this. I mean, the, probably there are many reasons, but one of my theories is that um, as folks who work with the web, we're used to a gigantic level of abstraction. Um, so we think of the web and we think of software at an extremely high level. Um, and we don't think about the fundamentals and the foundations because usually we don't have to touch them. And also they're really ugly, honestly, and they're not really very fun unless you're a particular kind of nerd. Um, and so security requires these foundations, and I think that's why it is kind of largely neglected. And so that's kind of why I want to talk about some of these fundamentals in this talk, because I think they really help get you to a place where you can understand uh, some of the security issues uh, on the web. So, all right. So why does learning about security matter? Um, I guess we've covered that, but mostly, um, what I want to say about that is uh, that oftentimes we, like many of us, don't work on gigantic teams that also have a security department that vets things in any way. So it's important for all of us, if we're creating things, to have a little bit of a sense of what's up um, and understand what some of the dangers are. Um, all right. So I apologize for the fonts. I had a bit of a, there was a, problem with sending them in and whatever. So basically, this was supposed to be a little bit cuter, but oh well. Uh, so, so we're going to talk about what happens when you request a web page in your browser. So we now talk pretty much all the time about the cloud. Um, like, you know, my parents talk about the cloud. Um, probably even like folks' grandparents' generation um, talk about the cloud. And it's sort of like this really tidy, nice abstraction. Like, you can kind of imagine like data raining down on you um, and other data like just like flowing up magically. And, and a lot of the time, the reason that that's really cool is because you kind of assume that it's just like always there and it doesn't really matter what's inside it and you just kind of have to maybe fetch some data from it. And uh, even if you're, if you're a developer, maybe you're just fetching some data down from the cloud and you're rendering it in a, in a nice way and providing some functionality on top of it, but you don't really, you don't really think about it. Um, and so that's, you know, that's not really how that works, right? So we make a lot of assumptions about the cloud. Oops. Um, and so, for example, we assume that it's reliable. We assume that it's always there. Uh, we assume that it's kind of like a single entity. We don't think about all the moving parts, and we don't think about what happens when some of those parts fail. We don't really think about what happens between us and the cloud. Um, and, and we just have, like, all of these really, uh, like, all of these assumptions, and they're different from one person to another, and I, like, if you want to have a really fun time, uh, quiz some of your friends about what they think the cloud is, and it's, it's actually really enlightening. Um, and I saw a talk by a, a security researcher recently where uh, she talked to a bunch of people about how they think the internet works, and one of the things that really blew my mind is that apparently there, it is, there is a vast belief that the mobile internet is kind of an entirely separate entity from the desktop internet. Um, so there you go. Um, so I think another thing that we really assume when we talk about uh, making stuff for the web is that we think of communications as having state. Like we think of having interactions uh, in a way that like, you know, this, this piece of the cloud, like Google knows who I am and it, I'm just kind of doing like continuous actions uh, with, in my interaction with this cloud. And that's, that's not really the case. Um, and so that's, that's where one of the places where this stuff gets really dicey. Um, so for this, uh, and again, I apologize for the fonts. Um, so we're going to dive into a world of Harry Potter examples um, because I love Harry Potter, so why not? Um, so in this scenario that we're walking into, um, we have uh, you know, an older Harry Potter who is fighting against a new rise of the Dark Lord and some general anti-muggle sentiment and ugly fascist bullshit. So, um, and, and it, it, please no, no cursed child spoilers because I actually haven't read it yet. So, um, 
Yeah, so, so basically Harry, you know, is living his life and he started a blog to kind of like comment on the increasing anti-muggle sentiment in society and all of the alarming things that he's seeing. So he spins up uh, a blog and it's hosted by a friend of his and he just, you know, starts typing away happily. Um, now, let's say that I would like to access this blog because I want to, you know, I'm also concerned about fascism. I don't think it's very nice. Um, and so uh, what happens when I try to go to this website? So the first thing to remember is that there are literally zeros and ones being transmitted somehow. Um, and usually that somehow is um, across a noop wire. Um, so there is like literally physical wires that are like under the ocean and under the soil and between buildings and inside of walls. Um, and so, and that's not a direct line. Like you're, you, you have, you're connecting to a server somewhere when you're, when you're accessing a web page uh, or some web app or whatever. Um, and, and usually that, that there's a fairly complex winding path of literal wires that gets you there. Um, and sometimes there's, there's also Wi-Fi. So in Wi-Fi, you can think of it as literally screaming the zeros and ones through the air. Um, so there's, and these points, like a lot of things happen, like an ocean, and usually there's like a router that's the next spot uh, on the way to your data uh, from your house. And then there's like an ISP, maybe Bell. Um, and then there's also an ISP on the other end. So there's basically, there's like a lot of pit stops. Um, and, and those pit stops can all essentially, if we're shouting zeros and ones, um, Voldemort could just like take over those spots, right? Like any of these and just be like, hey, you are, let's show me those zeros and ones because it's a fit, literal wire. You can just like tap into it and do stuff with it. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of slightly concerning, right? Like who's, who's really protecting your ISP? Who's protecting your router? Um, and and what's, what kind of stuff can they, can they do? Um, and, and so one of the things that's really, that, that we don't think about often about the way that all of this data flows and all the stuff that happens there um, is, is domains. Um, and so I'm going to talk a fair bit about the domain name system because I think it's a particularly kind of unintuitive one um, and also particularly vulnerable. Um, so so this, this URL, harryblogs.potterweasleyfamily.com, isn't really a place on the internet. Um, and so places on the internet are actually labeled with IP addresses. But obviously, if you had to type an IP address to go visit a site every time you wanted to see a site, that would like not be very fun. So um, some genius created the domain name system, and it is like a fairly tangled thing that it does. Um, and so what it does is that it is essentially, it's, a, it's essentially a recursive um, address book. So what, when it's looking for a domain name, first it asks the browser, and then it asks the OS, and then it asks the router, and then the ISP, and it goes all the way up until it finds what's called an authoritative name server. Um, so I'm gonna just walk through that a tiny bit. Hello. Um, so basically your computer is gonna ask the browser if it knows what this URL is. The browser's gonna say no. Um, and then it's gonna ask the router. The router's gonna say no. And then the ISP is gonna be asked, and the ISP is gonna be like, nah. Um, then uh, we're gonna go to the root domain name server. And the root domain, domain name server is uh, one of like 12, I think, um, that exist in the world. And so it knows about top level domains. And so it says, well, no, but there's a .com in there and I know about .com. So here, go to this, top, this uh, domain server for the top level domain. Um, so uh, the request is gonna go there and it's gonna ask uh, the top level domain uh, name server, do you know about this URL? And it's gonna say, well, no, but I do know about the domain potterweasleyfamily.com and it has the following name server. And so this is this ns1.somehosting.com um, is something that you've probably seen. Raise your hand if you've ever set up a URL, like a domain, bought a domain. Yeah, so that's, that's basically like your hosting company or the, the registrar rather where you registered the domain is gonna ask you to put in some name servers um, and so you're gonna do that. And so then this request is gonna know, aha, all right, next, next stop is this, domain, uh, this, uh, this name server. And so we're gonna ask that name server and that is gonna be the authoritative one because it's gonna say, yes, I do know about harryblogs.potterweasleyfamily.com and here is the IP at which you will find it. And so now in this like kind of, um, and, and now what it's gonna do is it's actually going to, the request is gonna come back and it's going to cache uh, the information that it got from the authoritative name server 
at all of the levels it goes through. And so that's what's called the TTL, which is maybe something that you've also seen when registering a domain that is kind of mysterious. Um, so that's how long this gets cached for. Um, and so then what's gonna happen um, is that when your neighbor next door requests this blog, the ISP is gonna know, or if your roommate requests this, uh, this URL, then actually the router in your house is gonna know if it's within the, that expiry limit. Um, so basically, we just did this like very roundabout trip, and all of this was just to figure out where the hell the address of this website is. So um, this is like really slow sometimes. Um, so often, uh, a weird consequence of this is that if you're accessing, let's say that I am accessing a website hosted in Costa Rica that no one in my neighborhood, uh, or let's say really pessimistically no one in Canada has accessed, then that request is actually gonna be really slow to come through because it's not gonna have been cached. So I'm gonna go all the way up the chain and it's gonna come all the way back down, where something like Google is probably cached a million times over. Um, so, okay, now we have an address. Fantastic. So now, um, let's, let's say that diagonal hosting is actually hosted in like, is actually physically in Hawaii. We just took like a pretty epic detour. Um, and, and now we have to go all the way to Luna Lovegood's basement where this website is hosted uh, back in England. Um, so, and then after this detour, all right, we're gonna do, um, whoops, lost that, okay. We're gonna do another thing, which is basically we're just gonna ask this server to dance. Um, and, and it's, it, you're just basically like, hey, are you there? And the server says, yeah, I'm here. All right, yes, I wanna talk to you. Um, and so that, that's you know, back and forth through those wires. Um, and, um, and then we actually get to what probably most folks working on the web are familiar with, which is an HTTP request. So in this case, we're just uh, sending a get, which just means like I wanna pull this data down. Um, and uh, it's some HTML is gonna come down to us. Um, and of course, this is a very simple representation of what would actually happen on a blog because we all know that the internet right now um, looks a little bit more like this. Um, so if you have a blog, you probably have like ads and you probably have like, you know, some social media links and more ads and maybe you're using like some sort of CDN to host your video and maybe you're using another CDN like to host your like jQuery and your jQuery carousel plugin and maybe you're using something like Discus for the comments, and like you've just got like a ton of stuff embedded in there. And so, again, for every single request that you're making, you have to do that whole DNS round trip, you have to do the whole TCP thing, and then you have to do the HTTP thing. So like, that is like a lot of activity that's going on. Um, and so just to start thinking uh, about this from a security perspective, if any of these requests somehow were intercepted and like a curse came back at you instead of the HTML or the JavaScript or the image that you wanted, that's, that's pretty bad because there's a lot of opportunities embedded in a web page like this. Um, and, and there's a lot of opportunities in particular with something like an ad network that's actually embedded in a ton of different websites across the internet. If you can take over one of those and have it send like the Cruciatus curse or whatever, um, like that, you're, that is some serious havoc that you're wreaking. Um, so, uh, I don't know where I'm going next. Oh, right, yes, let's break this completely simple and logical system. So this is my very terrible drawing of Voldemort. He's surprisingly difficult to draw. Um, so, yeah, so if you see that, think Voldemort, adversary, evil guy, whatever. Um, so, all right, we've got this very convoluted way of getting our data. We're shouting some zeros and ones across these wires to a bunch of different places. Um, and again, just to reiterate, a lot of these, everything that you're sending across these wires is visible to anyone who can access any of these points or who is on a, on a Wi-Fi network with you or any of these points if for some reason that was happening. Um, so yeah, um, essentially what that means is, um, all right, hold on, back up. I don't know where I was going, but I'm gonna rewind and talk about DNS again um, and talk about how DNS could break in particular. So we're gonna talk about the, the pink line over there. Um, so maybe if you are a web developer, you have had to edit your host file. So raise your hands if you've had to edit your host file. 
So maybe that was for like local development or for accessing something on a corporate network or something like that. So it's actually also a really simple prank you can do if someone leaves you their laptop. Um, you can edit host file and you can replace their favorite, your, their favorite website um, with an IP address. Um, and so what this means basically is that this, um, this domain will resolve to that IP address. Um, and so that's pretty evil because this is as close as I could get to Voldemort uh, in the real world. And this is actually one of the IPs for Donald Trump's website. So, you know, like your friend goes to like Smitten Kitchen looking for recipes and it's like Donald Trump. And you're like, ooh. Yeah, so, so that, that would be a pretty, pretty mean thing to do. Um, and so that's also, for example, what happens. Um, so, so you can basically insert a record uh, anywhere in this chain, right? Um, and so recall that when you, um, when you look something up and you find it, it gets cached all the way down, right? Um, so, yeah, these are, something's missing. Okay, there. So uh, with, with, if, someone, if Voldemort were to somehow you know, break into your router um, and change a record, uh, that would be then cached all the way down, and maybe that would have a very long uh, time to live, TTL. So then, actually, even if your router was fixed, your OS and your browser would still think that something terrible is going on and that Smitten Kitchen is actually Donald Trump's website or that whatever Harry Potter site is actually like something about how actually Death Eaters are wonderful. Um, and so this is actually the exact same, tr one, of the, one of the ways that this trick is executed where you like happily try to go read your favorite web comic and you're in an airport and then like your browser kind of chokes for a second and then it tries to send you to some site where you can pay an outrageous amount of money for really crappy Wi-Fi. Um, and this is also used on, on corporate networks. There might also be a DNS server, um, wh which allows you to access some sort of like internal tools or stuff like that, um, like internal wiki or whatever. Um, and then the URL wouldn't work if you're outside of that network. Um, and this is also a really easy trick that some repressive regimes use for censorship. So maybe at the entire uh, national level, you have certain uh, domains that are blocked and that actually forward you to, I don't know, something else um, or, or simply don't work. So, all right, so that's, so this, this what I'm, what I'm uh, describing here is called cash poisoning um, and it's, it's pretty nasty. Um, and it is, you know, one of the ways that uh, Voldemort could trick my very complicated winding path around the world through wires into going somewhere else. Um, so by saying at some level, the, uh, the URL that you're trying to access is actually located somewhere else at this other IP address. Um, and, and if we're talking about a router, if we're talking about a corporate network, for example, I could get in there or Voldemort could get in there um, if like say the router has a default admin password or something like that. Um, and modify those records, and then like probably it would take a while for someone to figure out what was going on. Um, all right, so, so let's do a little bit of recap. Um, so with the internet as it works in this way that we've described, um, I can see what you're saying. Um, for example, I can see your passwords, I can see your home address, your social security number, social insurance number, your, all your sort of personal information. I can read your like sad poetry, I can read your medical records. I can read whatever you're sending over plain text. Um, and I can also, uh, with a little bit of cleverness, I can trick you into accessing the wrong website. And one of the ways is by pointing uh, a domain at the wrong place. And there's a number of other ways that I could fool you into accessing something different than what you think you're accessing. Um, so we're gonna, oh my God, fonts. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of uh, everyone's favorite class, Defense Against the Dark Arts. And, um, and we're gonna talk about how we can defend ourselves against uh, a number of problems, uh, in particular, the DNS problem that, that I outlined. Um, and so, all right, so let's say that Harry is organizing a rally and he's using his blog um, and he wants some volunteers for this rally, he wants some speakers, he wants some people to do crowd control, uh, some medics. Um, so, you know, so he sets up a form on his website to get people to sign up. Um, and so people are submitting their information, like, you know, name of my kids, my age, where I live, whatever. And, uh, and Voldemort's like, ha, well, this was easy. Um, so he's just sitting there somewhere. He's done some sort of DNS wizardry or some other dark magic. 
Um, and he, maybe he's just sitting on that information and he's not passing it on um, so that Harry doesn't get any volunteers. Or maybe he's just quietly keeping that information um, and, uh, and passing it on so that Harry is none the wiser. Um, and this is what we might call a Voldemort in the middle attack or a man in the middle attack, um, where the attacker just like sits somewhere and pretends to be uh, the party that you are trying to communicate with. So, okay, so we've probably all heard about encryption. Um, encryption is pretty cool. Um, and essentially what we're doing uh, with encryption is we're doing like fancy math uh, and we're not gonna go into the math here because it's not necessary to, to understand what's going on. Um, so the, the, the sort of, I think, the more well-known form of encryption is that you have some sort of key and you, you some sort of like magic number, basically, and you use it uh, in some mathematical operation to generate gibberish that only someone with that key can have. So let's say that we invented uh, some protocol that does this. Um, so then we would, we would send gibberish and the server, Harry's server in Luna Lovegood's basement, would send some gibberish back, and somehow magically we would be uh, able to read that. But the problem here is that we don't have any way of knowing whether we're encrypting to the right person, right? Like unless Harry has actually met all these people before and exchanged this magic number, there's, there's really like, all you know is like, okay, I'm encrypting. But like, that doesn't necessarily give you any guarantees because Voldemort's server that's sitting in the middle here somewhere could also set up encryption, and then you're like, yay, I'm using encryption. But like, actually, you're encrypting stuff to Voldemort, and Voldemort is sending you encrypted stuff back. So, so that's not super useful. So um, it turns out that the, the kind of cryptography that we do use for this kind of stuff um, is, is a lot smarter than that, and it has some, some pretty interesting properties. So, you, oh, well, okay, this is, this is my scenario drawn out to its logical conclusion. Voldemort provides an alternative location for the rally and rounds everyone up and bad, th bad things happen. Yay! Um, so, all right, so math, so it turns out that math can do better. Um, and so um, what, we what we were talking about before uh, is what we call symmetric encryption. Um, and so what that does is it's, it's, as I described, like there's one key it's some sort of magic number and you do some magical operation with it and only the person who also has this magic number uh, can decrypt and then use it to encrypt back to you. Um, and so basically the problem there is that you, you basically have to like exchange that key in person or send a carrier pigeon or like you, you, probably magic could solve this but like let's not get into that. Um, so, so, but there's um, actually asymmetrical encryption um, and that is really cool uh, because basically what it does is it takes this magic number secret key um, and it derives from it a public key. And that's a thing that you can just like publish. You can tweet it. You can put it wherever the hell you want. Um, and, uh, and it's not a secret and no one has to keep it safe. Um, but people can use it in order to encrypt stuff for you. Um, and so that is some seriously cool math, which is out of scope, but really cool and worth learning about. Um, and so basically this public key represented by the shield with a key, um, is, is what you can use uh, for a lot of things on the web. So one of the cool things about the public key is that it is unique. And so because it is unique, you can sort of use it as part of um, an identity system. So I have a secret key, only I know it. And from it is derived a public key, which you can know, but is unique. So using that public key means that you have certainty that you are encrypting stuff for me and only I will see it. Um, and so thus, um, you can create a certificate, which is essentially a kind of digital passport. Um, and what that is, is basically a public key and some metadata, some information uh, that is more human readable. Um, so for example, like domain, uh, harryblogs.potterweasleyfamily.com, the owner is Harry Potter, and maybe it has like Harry Potter's address or something like that. Um, and then also the date in which that was issued. But hold on, if I'm Voldemort, like I can probably issue this myself. Like I can just lie and say I'm Harry Potter. There's nothing preventing me from doing that. So just holding this passport, which I can just generate myself, is no guarantee, right? So uh, this is where the system gets kind of convoluted all over again. So what happens with this, this um, certificate, with this sort of digital passport, is that it gets stamped. Um, so 
basically it gets signed by some entity, which is the entity that actually gives you the passport. So there's like an issuing uh, body, and in this case it might be the registrar that also sold me the domain. Um, and um, this is similarly just like a thing that you usually purchase uh, from your registrar or from some other company. And so what they do is they provide a seal of approval, and that's also um, a fancy math operation. Uh, it's basically proof that they, with their own key, um, validate that they know who you are and that they gave you the certificate. Uh, so it's, it's basically mathematical proof that this entity, with their public key, knows you. Um, and so, of course, again, we run into a problem. Who the hell is vouching for diagonal hosting? Um, and so then we go another step further and we create a, a chain of signing um, or a chain of trust. Um, and so, essentially, Diagonal hosting is going to have their own public key and certificate, um, and that is going to be uh, that is going to be signed by some other identity. In this case, Gringotts identity. And um, and the thing about Gringotts identities in this fictional world of mine, uh, or of J.K. Rowling's, but extended, um, <laughs> is, is is that they're a root authority. And so these are things that exist in the actual real world, and there are not very many of them. They're usually sort of at the national level and they you know, have, have different, slightly different roles depending. But um, basically what a root authority is, is an authority uh, that has its own private key and public key and, sign, and their job is to sign other people's certificates. And their own certificate is actually included with your, uh, inside your OS or your browser or something in your device. And basically the, the trust of that is built in. So, um, to make a, a rather complex system maybe a little clearer, um, so that's your browser, it has some root, uh, root certificates. Um, what's gonna happen if you're trying to talk to a website over HTTPS is you're gonna say, hello, I would like to talk to Harry's blog securely over an encrypted connection. And so then that, uh, the website is gonna respond, yes, this is in fact Harry's blog, here's some information about me, and here's my public key, and you may use this for encryption. Um, and so then my computer is going to say, wait, how can I trust that this is true? Um, and so then that server is going to reply, well, here's my seal of approval from, diagon from diagonal hosting. Um, and so then my computer is going to say, all right, hey, diagonal hosting, do you know this guy? Do, do you vouch for the certificate? Um, and so diagonal hosting is going to say, yes, I totally vouch for this guy. I issued the certificate. Here's some information about me. Um, and then my computer will ask, okay, but who vouches for you? How do I know who you are? And then um, Diagonal Hosting will say, look me up, uh, look this up, Gringotts Identity vouches for me. And then I can check, oh yeah, I know who Gringotts Identities is, and they are a trusted source. And so therefore, I trust Diagonal Hosting. And since Diagonal Hosting trusts this blog, I'm going to trust it too. So, kind of convoluted. Uh, in many cases, it has a lot more steps than this. Um, it's, it, it's sort of tricky, and it's also the kind of thing that gets really political, because these uh, root certificate authorities are obviously extremely important to the functioning of, of the internet, because it's like, it's like a house of cards, right? If one of them falls, then there's like all of these uh, sites that depend on them. Um, and so if you, if you like good thrillers, I really recommend reading about Stuxnet. Um, because that is just like an epic political tale in the real world that involves certificate authorities. Um, and that's, that's really fun. Um, and, and so yeah, so, so basically these are extremely important entities because uh, our sort of decentralized trust system rests completely on their shoulders. Um, all right, so now if you have set up HTTPS and it is all working correctly and everything is signed uh, and your browser can do all of this verification, um, if you try some DNS hijinks or Voldemort tries some DNS hijinks or you are trying to trick your friend into accessing Donald Trump's website, you're gonna get one of these um, fun error messages. Now you might also get one of these error messages for a different reason such as the certificate has expired. Um, there's a lot of legit things that could be happening um, but one of the, the thing that it's basically trying to prevent is you accidentally accessing the wrong site because there has been some DNS cache poisoning or there has been some other um, bad thing happening uh, over the network. So, um, all right, so a little, just a little bit of a recap. 
uh, before wrapping up. So why should I use HTTPS? Um, so the first thing is that it prevents snooping. So if, if you're on a Wi-Fi network and you're talking to a website over HTTPS, uh, it's shout, you're shouting gibberish across the air. Um, and so that's, that's a lot better than um, shouting your actual sad poetry across the, across the room. Um, and the second really important thing is that, it'll, that HTTPS will raise hell if someone is pretending to be you. And that is also really, really important. Um, and again, I focused a bit on DNS because I think it's a particularly weird one, but there's another, uh, a ton of other kinds of attacks uh, in that really complex dance of uh, zeros and ones across wires that will also be stopped by using HTTPS in a very similar way by uh, being able to verify identity. Um, and so, oh, my emoji aren't working. All right, um, so why doesn't everybody do this, right? Why are we still using unencrypted internets? Um, and, and the reason for this has been that largely up until recently, um, getting a certificate cost money. Um, and the second part is that it was like a gigantic pain in the ass. Um, so has anyone here ever tried to set up HTTPS? Was it a world of pain? Yeah, it, it's like, I, I remember the first time that I did it, I like meticulously wrote down everything I did, like from the actual purchasing process and like which option I chose, um, and then like various command line tools that you had to use to like generate the right things and then put them in the right place. And then of course, the second time I tried to do this with a different provider, the steps were completely different and nothing worked and I wanted to cry. Um, so yeah, it's just like a kind of horrific process. Uh, sadly, like many things that have to do with encryption, really painful. Um, and so that is thankfully no longer the case um, because uh, Mozilla and the EFF and a bunch of other awesome folks um, came together to form uh, Let's Encrypt. Um, and Let's Encrypt is its own uh, certificate authority. Uh, so it can issue certificates and it does so for free, which is very exciting. And they have also created this awesome tool called CertBot, which uh, makes it really easy to actually set it up. So you don't have to go to some website and download something and then convert it and then like do all this crap. Um, you actually can just run a little uh, wizard um, from the command line and it'll do it for you. Um, and then also if you've got some slightly more complicated uh, web server setups, uh, DigitalOcean, bless them. They have the best documentation team ever. Uh, they also have some guides on how to do this with uh, uh, Nginx and Apache. Um, and uh, there's a couple of um, shared hosting providers that also have this now built into their GUI. So DreamHost uh, got on it like really, really quickly. And there, if you're hosting a domain, you can literally just check off like, I want to use Let's Encrypt um, for HTTPS on this domain. And yay, it's set up. That's all you need to do. Um, so that is super sweet. Um, there's also uh, Let's Encrypt itself maintains a list of web hosting providers that uh, have support in a similar fashion. Um, and then I guess uh, beyond just using HTTPS, um, as a user, there's certain things that you can do to protect yourself from the evils of the internet. Um, and one of those is uh, making sure that your browser is always using HTTPS if it's available, that it's, it's checking uh, if, if HTTPS is there. Um, some browsers do this automatically now, I think, uh, but there is a, a browser extension that you can add that'll do that. Um, and then another thing, and like all the digital marketers in the room are like glaring at me right now. Um, but one kind of good thing that you can do for yourself is block ads. And that's both for your like user experience, because as we saw, every single request that your browser makes is potentially really slow. Um, and so if you're loading a million ads and a million social plugins and a million things when you go on someone's website, that's actually going to be like a huge detriment to actually getting where you want to be quickly. Um, and the second part of it is also that they are notoriously, um, I guess, profitable to attack maliciously because the attack surface is so huge. If you, if you get into an ad network that has ads on porn sites, um, then all of a sudden you can send all kinds of terrible things to so many users. And that's actually a thing that happens uh, on a fairly regular basis. So uh, yeah, so ad and tracker blocking, it'll help. Um, and if you really love a blog that makes its money off ads, consider donating to them in some other way. Um, yeah. Um, and then as a developer, for the developers in the room, um, a question that I get a lot is like, well, how can I learn more? Um, and I think learning to be evil is like really fun. Um, 
And one of the things that you can do to scare your friends is play with Wireshark. Uh, so this is totally legal software. You can sit in a cafe and you can just watch, if you're on an insecure Wi-Fi network, you can just watch people's requests stream through. Um, and if they're not encrypted, you can just see exactly what people are reading. Like your person next to you is watching porn in a cafe. What a weirdo, firstly. But secondly, like you can see what they're doing. Um, and then there's um, some really great books from No Starch Press. Um, the, the Tangled Web and Silence on the Wire are by the same guy and they kind of go through these kinds of fundamentals in a lot of depth, like they talk about cookies and stuff like that and a lot of the ways that the HTTP protocol itself is like really messed up. Um, and the Silence on the Wire is sort of similar but leaning more towards uh, kind of how to craft attacks. Um, and penetration testing is just like a hands-on guide to some of the tools that you can use uh, to do things like uh, cache poisoning. Um, DNS cache poisoning. Um, the other thing, and this is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately, is uh, learn about the security features and the tools and frameworks that you use. Um, and I would also in this space say, if you are a teacher, if you teach at a, at a boot camp or something like that, uh, teach those tools. Like frameworks like Rails and, and Django have a gajillion security features. Um, and they're often the kind of thing that um, sort of new and intermediate developers kind of ignore and are like a bit puzzled by. I remember when I was starting to work with Rails uh, some years back, I was like, what are these CSRF tokens? What the hell is this? This is kind of tedious. Uh, it's getting in my way. And, and I have actually seen, um, not at my own work, but in other places, people who just disable them because they don't understand them. Um, and so I think if you're working with a framework, it's really worth it to dig into its security features and why they work. Um, and, yeah. And if you want to learn more uh, about some of the stuff that I talk about, uh, here are some resources. I'm going to put this online. Um, and uh, so these are some great videos, the computer file ones. Uh, Cat DNS is a deeper dive into DNS um, by another awesome, well, now former Montrealer. Um, and Server Farm to Table uh, does a bit of uh, the beginning of my talk uh, with really cute illustrations um, and just goes into more depth. Uh, so I would also really recommend that. Uh, and finally, if you uh, would like to talk to me, I am Flowdot on basically every platform, Twitter, GitHub, whatever. Um, so yeah, come chat. And if you are also interested in making security more accessible, come be my best friend. Uh, all right, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs>